thank you guys all for joining us. I'm so, so excited for our, our Zillow talk today because we have such a great esteemed speaker with us. Uh, before I get into his bio, I want to mention Steve is, is someone who's been a friend of Zillow. Steve and his wife, Carrie, for a number of years. Uh, Steve's wife, Carrie Van Rokel, actually helped Zillow with some of our initial branding seven years ago before we launched. She had run uh, marketing at Expedia and a bunch of us knew her there. And then I know there's a, quite a few people here who knew Steve in one capacity or another when he was at Microsoft. And so we've all really watched the last several years as Steve has made this meteoric rise into the <laughs> upper echelons of our federal government, and it's really, really exciting to have him back here talking to us and, and sharing his story with us. So let me just give you the quick bio um, of where he is today and how he got here. So Steve Van Rokel is the nation's second ever federal chief information officer. This is a, uh, a position that was created by Obama, is that right? Um, and he oversees or manages an $80 billion yearly portfolio of federal IT spending. Um, and Steve's path to Washington was a little bit of an unusual one in that he spent 15 years at Microsoft, in fact, at one point, speechwriter for Bill Gates, mm -hmm. and uh, went to Washington three years ago to be managing director of the FCC. His good work there was noticed at the top by the White House and a year ago moved over to the White House to be the second CIO and report to President Obama as a boss. <laughs> so, um, Steve, first of all, welcome so much to Zillow, both from our Seattle offices and all our offices around the yeah. country. We're really excited to have you. Thank you. Um, and let's just start, I mean, tell, what is federal CIO? What does that mean, other than managing a whole bunch of money in IT? Like, tell us about what that is. Yeah, first, thanks for not making me wear a suit today. It's, it's, a, it's, it's crazy you actually live in a climate where you can wear a suit, and I live in one where you have to, and, it's, and, and where you can't from a climate perspective, so I appreciate that. But uh, Federal CIO is, um, uh, the, some aspects of the role have actually been around since about the mid-90s. There was some laws passed by Congress called the E-Government Act uh, that, that actually uh, gives uh, um, some statutory authority to the to the White House to do a few things. One is manage the the federal portfolio, as you mentioned, both both controlling the the spend on technology across the executive branch and the Department of Defense. Um, uh, and then second is being able having the the statutory authority, the legal power to to set policy for government. So I can actually tell government to do certain things and and lay out policy that, that they have to follow that, uh, that affects the, our use of technology. So that power has actually been around since the mid-90s and has been enacted. When President Obama came in, he saw that, that one, we need, and it was never called the Chief Information Officer, it was actually the E-Government Administrator was the name of the name CIO of the, sounds a lot better. Yeah, it sounds like, oh yeah, I wouldn't have taken the job at E-Government Administrator. <laughs> and and it, it, uh, the role um, uh, was expanded under this president to, uh, to largely be an advisor to him. Uh, and an assistant to the president on the government's use of technology and probably more importantly, our use of technology and the way it affects American society. So how do we make it easier for business to do business? How do we shape cloud computing so we're the leader as a country in cloud computing? How do we foster technology learning and jobs and, and things like that? And so a lot of the job under, under President Obama has really been focused on kind of that aspect beyond just managing the, the spend within government. As you can imagine, having the one-two punch of, of, or the one-three punch of budget policy and then sort of using, uh, using the, utilizing the president's pen to often set policy is a, is a pretty, uh, pretty powerful thing to be able to think about. So what does your department look like? Who works for you and sort of where, what, how deep does your influence go? Yeah, so I've got, I've got, uh, about 30 or so people that, that are on my staff directly, and that uh, those uh, those policy analysts, which we call them, have one-to-one -one relationships with agencies of government. So one person could own the relationship with the Department of Defense or the Department of Agriculture, or the Department of Interior, kind of shepherding their use of technology along and and and, and focusing what they do, um, and more importantly, taking our policies and sort of 
you know, being the feet on the ground that work with those agencies to push those out. Um, I also have people that have specific focus. So there's people that are looking at, you know, converting data into machine readable or working on cloud computing, working on our data center consolidation efforts and, and sort of the myriad of things um, in kind of a, a very horizontal way across the whole of government. Um, and then I have dotted line relationships with the, the, the technology people across government. Um, the U.S. government has a 1.65 million uh, civilian employees and two to three X that on the military side that we oversee as users of the network, so to speak. And, and out in those, those places, there are tens of thousands of IT people and they all sort of dotted line up to, to think about us as, as use, utilizing them as our levers we pull to get things done. So. So I want to ask you more questions about sort of what your agenda is and the things you work on, but I also just, for us to kind of get an establishing view, I want to talk about how you got here and sort of the transition from private sector to, to, to public sector, because that was probably pretty interesting. So tell us a little bit about, was it three years ago when you first moved to Washington, kind of your first day of work at the FCC, what was that like? Yeah, so I, um, I, uh, I, I ended up in the job I left Seattle in, in January 2009 to go with three million of my friends to, to have a, a fun celebration in Washington, D.C. and the inauguration of the president, not thinking even in the slightest about a job in the federal government. Had never crossed my mind once, you know, and I went out to the inauguration and I had, a, I had lunch with a friend um, who was uh, in the publishing field and actually spent some time at Microsoft and told him that I was sort of in the soul searching uh, you know, part of my life, inflection point where I was thinking about what to do next. I had, I had only worked at Microsoft. Microsoft hired me out of college when it was pretty small and, and worked there for, to launch. I started launching Windows 3.11, Windows 4 work groups, if any of you remember that product, um, and, and worked my way through the company and, and did different things. Um, after having worked for Bill, Bill left in the summer of 2008 to go run the Gates Foundation full time, if you remember. Bill. Bill. <laughs> Bill. Bill. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and so, you know, once you've worked for him, there's sort of a funny dynamic. Once he's left, you sort of are, are thinking about what's next for yourself. And so I, I had this conversation with this friend just sitting in who had been, a, you know, was raised in D.C. and had a very D.C.-centric view and, and mentioned to him that I was soul searching. And he looked at me sort of like I was an idiot and said, you've got to join public service. You're a big fan of this president. You've done a lot of work, a bit of work for the campaign. Um, you've got to join public service. And I... I had no idea how my skills, I mean, I'm a geek at heart and how that applies to federal government. I don't fight wars. I don't, you know, I didn't deal with the economy. I didn't deal with education, all these sort of pressing needs that our country had. Um, and about 30 minutes after the lunch, my cell phone rang and it was the transition team. And, uh, and so I, I talked to this person on the transition team and, and ended up uh, going down to the transition building and having a meeting with um, a guy named Julius Janikowski who was running all the tech strategy for the, for the 08 campaign, including the online stuff. Um, and it was a college roommate or college uh, friend of, uh, at Harvard Law School with the, with the president, um, at that time, the president-elect. Um, and so Julius and I sat down uh, through, a, through a series of events, um, uh, came to realize that Julius actually knew my wife, Carrie, who's in the back of the room. And you're in the, you're in the midst of greatness in the room, not because I'm sitting here, but because she's sitting here. But she, uh, 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 Julius uh, had worked for Barry Diller upon the acquire of Expedia from Microsoft and was on the Expedia We board. actually had Julius here. He was our first oh, okay, yeah. Zillow speaker last August uh, as FCC chairman. So he's to blame. Uh, so Julius had just found out he was going to be asked to be FCC chairman and said he wanted me to join his team. And so we... Uh, we, we did the soul searching. I told Carrie, she cried uh, tears of, of anguish about leaving Seattle and we, uh, we decided to, uh, to make the leap. <laughs> we decided to make the leap over to, uh, yep, yeah, she cried. In days like today, with the weather outside like it is, she cries again. Um, and uh, we, uh, we made the leap, moved to, moved to DC. I, uh, I showed up at the Federal Communications Commission on my first day as managing director, which is the kind of chief operating officer, I ran the agency for Julius and he did the policy work. And upon showing up, I, I went to my desk, uh, jiggled the mouse, and uh, a product that I had launched about a decade before was there waiting for me, Windows, <laughs> <laughs> Windows XP. And so I was like, okay, this is where we are. Uh, the, the, 
in, in DC, in government, there's a, there's a ranking uh, by a nonprofit called the Partnership for Public Service. There's a ranking called the best places to work in government. Uh, the FCC was second from last on the list, best places to work. Um, uh, the selective service, the people who do the draft, was the one right below it. Uh, and so we had a culture problem, we had a technology problem, we had an internet connection that didn't work, we had, you know, just... Well, I mean, the FCC regulates all the those internet, things. right? Yeah, yeah, so uh, they should have a working yeah, internet. Like, yeah. Well, he doesn't regulate the internet, but helps foster a better internet. Um, yeah, my politic words here. Uh, and so we, you know, what should have been probably the most tech forward agency in government, you know, it was the agency that sort of fostered in Wi-Fi, that fostered in the, you know, modern communications as we know it, um, was so behind the times. And, and, uh, and so we did a lot of work to, uh, to not only, you know, embrace technology in a way that can lever up on efficiency and engage in the employees, but we, we did something that was very important, I think, that, that you probably all learn in the private sector every day, which is that management doesn't own the culture of the organization, that, that the employees own the culture, and that's something that's somewhat foreign in government, especially when you cut the top of the leadership pyramid off every 48 years and bring in new people. Um, it's, you've got to embody that spirit in the, in the employee base, and so that's, that was really the inflection we struck, which was, you know, I, I turned to employees and said, I'm not going to fix what's going on in this agency. You are. And so we set up social media tools behind the walls and, and let people start to collaborate on how to reform the agency, how to implement technology. And just amazing things started to happen when, when we, put, we gave employees permission to kind of innovate in this area. Uh, and uh, within a year, we were not only the most improved agency, but in the top three best places to work in government and, uh, and had technology streamlined and had hybrid vehicles and we'd greened and we'd, we'd done a ton of things to just embrace the ideas that employees had and we did it all on a declining budget. And so we were able to show that that model works in a small microcosm of a 2,000 person organization like the FCC. And then that's what sort of got people in, inspired to think about that model for the whole of government. Which is well, and one of the things you did at the FCC had to do with transparency, with, with opening up the department and through sh social media and kind of being transparent about what was actually going on inside. Um, how is that happening or how are you thinking about that throughout government and in your new position? Yeah, we, I mandated, one, one, we just embrace social media as a, as a core way of engaging Americans. Most Americans didn't know what the FCC did. I think if you asked, walked up with a you know, person on the street kind of, kind of model for, for the FCC, they would think you did really one thing, you know, regulated Howard Stern or Janet Jackson at the Super Bowl, and that's about it. When, when in reality, that was such a tiny percentage of what the FCC actually did on the in, you know, indecency enforcement kind of stuff, which is what the, uh, the prior FCC really kind of prided and branded itself around. And so we had a, a big job, a brand and awareness issue, and so we, we embraced social media as a very low-cost way of getting out there and did a lot of cross-pollination work and contests and other things to get, get people uh, the awareness numbers up. We actually went up to the largest um, independent agency following on Twitter and we're actually number two just behind the White House as far as Twitter followers um, at about 450,000 I think is what we ended up at when I left and probably more by now. Um, so, so that was a very successful way of getting out there. I also mandated as we were re-engineering systems behind the scenes that any time we did anything related to data, either our consumption, our use, or our dissemination of data, that that be open data, machine readable. Um, we, had, we had suffered the, the decades of paper in the agency to the point where we had rooms that were just boxes and stacks of paper, and I was very frustrated with that. I'm like, we need to go and foster a new way of doing that. And second was, any time we solved a, a problem through technology, we not only did it in an agile or small, kind of lean startup way around the way we solved those problems, but we also did it all in a way that were, were based around open standards and web services. So uh, we, we created kind of this, this spirit of modularity inside the agency, which is very normal in the private sector, but very foreign to government. And so I, um, I've taken that notion, that small, you know, everything must be machine readable and we have to, when we solve problems, it has to be done in these kind of lightweight ways that are reusable and scale that. I now have the authority to scale that across government and so released a strategy a couple months ago that basically ordered ordered all of government to, to do those things. And so as the new normal, the new default, any new data that is, is consumed, used, or disseminated from government needs to be done in these machine readable ways. We need to open things up in APIs. We need to publish those things. We need to embrace developers in a new way. Um, when we, as a, as a government, 
you know, released uh, weather data uh, in the mid part of the century and in the mid 80s released, you know, global positioning system data, um, almost overnight we turned on $100 billion of, of economic value for this country. And I think if you, if you think about, and this is funny, the example I always use in speeches when I talk about this stuff is, um, you know, most Americans' largest purchase in their life is a home. Um, and I talk about the, the data that's available on home purchases. Well, I don't name names with you guys, but, I, uh, but I, I'm implying a lot of the work, good work you do here um, in saying that, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, the data, the, the data of old on these websites, and you guys know this better than I do, was always about the roof composition and the number of bathrooms and parking and the bedrooms and things like that. When you know, I care more about the broadband connection that's available at that house. I care more about is there an organic farm within 25 miles? What's the state of health care? What's the state of education near here? And fundamentally changing the way we value homes could, could you know, turn on a dime if we unlocked all this government data and made that available to people. I mean, you've, you're the shining example of that where you've taken government data and turned it into a real value of, 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 uh, of thinking about valuation. And well, I think and about where that could go, it's just phenomenal. I don't think, we're probably not aware of all the data the government has that you could open up. So give us some examples of that. I mean, what are some things that we probably use or see all the time that we may not even know that's government data? Yeah, we, uh, the, I don't even know of all the government data that's out there, but almost anything within the realm of imagination is probably captured by the U.S. government in some way. Um, <laughs> I mean, serious. When I, when I unveiled this digital strategy, uh, the number one question I got from all these developers and entrepreneurs that came up to me was, what if I think there's data out there, but I don't know who has it, I don't know where to find it, how do I do that, how do I engage that? And the core piece of the strategy was, uh, using crowdsourcing tools. So agencies are in the mode right in the midst right now of in, in, in the next couple of weeks we'll be releasing uh, inquiries to their public, their customers that basically say, you know, here are data sets we think could be interesting, but we want your ideas on what data you think we have that we could release uh, publicly. But, you know, the stuff when I, when I uh, talk about house uh, values, you know, I talk, uh, you know, we have data in this country about agriculture, uh, sustainable agriculture, energy, uh, flood, public safety, education, healthcare um, are all kind of core tenets of what you could surround, you know, uh, environmental, uh, think about toxic waste dumps and things like that. So, all that is government data that's locked up. That we so need. you see a future where a company like Zillow, uh, our, our developers could, could, could dip into these huge scores of government data and use it on our site or, or use it with our own data and APIs and that sort of thing? Is Absolutely, that yeah, and just consume that. I mean, the, the beauty of government is always when we, we bring government to people where they are versus they have to come to government. I mean, we have 40 to 50,000 websites in the federal government and, and the way we've developed them over time is just very broken. Uh, if you're a student and want to get a student loan, there's 14 websites for that. It's a different website to learn about it than it is to apply, than it is to refinance, and there's multiple refinance options and way you can do that. Um, and so, but when you whip out your iPhone or your smartphone and you click the weather app on the home page, or you're, you launch Foursquare and you check in at your favorite restaurant or, or club or something and tag a photo on Facebook and, and indicate where you are, you launch the Zillow app and you're driving around doing house values, that's all government data coming to you where you are versus you having to go to, you know, uh, housing and urban development gov and try to dive into where that stuff is and so it's the the beauty of, of government will really be when we bring it to people versus make people come to government and so i think unlocking data the way we did with weather and gps has two small little examples will foster in the biggest the area where we've probably done the best other than those two is is healthcare data right now we've we've unlocked lots of healthcare data um, in the last couple of weeks, um, I, I worked with the, uh, the Commerce Department and we just created it, wrapped an API around census data. So if you wanted to publish on Zillow, you know, what's the census demographics across a certain region, that's now available. Um, I think we would like to publish that on <laughs> <Yeah>. Zillow. <laughs> Broadbandmap.gov too has APIs for broad, a broad bank, all the broadband capabilities in this country too. So it's stuff like that that really you know, brings into the fold just a different way of thinking about where I am and what's available to me. So. so what are the barriers to opening up more of that? Is it time, talent? Is there opposition to this that you have to work through? I mean, what keeps that from happening tomorrow with everything? Yeah, I think part, part of it is just, just 
systems for people that know APIs and know web services, it, you know, it does take a level of talent to, to be able to get those done and done well. Um, I think that the biggest thing, though, is sort of this culture of paper, culture of manual processes that we've had in the past, and the daunting aspect of that. That's why I'm very careful to always talk about the new default or the new normal in government, to say, okay, let's, let's not pay attention to the past, because if you let that weigh you down, you think about the daunting task of going in and like ripping out privacy information about all these documents that we had in the past and how do you, you know, we don't have a national scanning commission that's scanning the mountains of paper we have. So it's gotta be about, you know, a going forward. You know, let's capture, let's disseminate, let's use and let's disseminate in just a new way that's gonna get us into a new normal for the long term. So a decade from now, we've got a decade worth of electronic data and just this new way of doing it. Um, so I think a lot of it is just the, the cost burden and the talent, the culture around you know the, the the past and trying to get through that inflection point. And so we're doing a lot to bring in private sector people and 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 describe new ways of building things in government and doing all this to to push out a new normal within uh, within the space. Is it hard to get talented engineers and developers to come work for the federal government? It's hard to it's it's probably it's pretty hard to attract people. Um, to realize what a tremendous opportunity is available in the federal government. I mean, it's, it's been the most eye-opening thing for me is, is uh, I, like I said, I went to the inauguration never contemplating going to work for the federal government. It didn't cross my mind. And I think if you talk to a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of innovators, you know, they, they never think of the government as, a, as an opportunity for them to get leverage on their business plans or get loans or get seed funding, all these things that are available to them. So I think there's a huge disconnect between that community and sort of the government, both on an employment basis and an enablement basis. And, and so a lot of what we do, um, a lot of what I do is go out and just talk to people about what's available, what's out there, what, we, you, know, what you can do. And what's incredible about the US federal government is that it, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, the possibilities and the life adventure that's associated with those possibilities to have impact in this country is just tremendous. And I don't think there is, you know, you have this, I, for the many dec the couple decades that I spent at Microsoft, I had this starry-eyed notion that everything I was doing would, would make the world better through technology, and we'd be able to really kind of you know just just create a different dynamic. And I think you look at productivity gains generally. I think the industry has done a lot for society in that standpoint. But the lever-up ability you have in the federal government to drive impact and change—I mean, it saves lives. It makes us safer. It's just incredible to do if you do it well. And and so the the opportunity. Plus, you get to work on projects that are, you know, the Curiosity rover that's now on Mars and the and the, the International Space Station and aircraft carriers and all this just just cool stuff is pretty pretty amazing as well. So. Well, and it's interesting in this age to see some of that too, like the Curiosity rover having Facebook and Twitter accounts that people are following and kind of have an eye into it. It definitely seems like there's big opportunities to personalize some of that. It is, yeah. It, it's the impact of social media and government is, is super profound, mostly because, and this is what I use to my best advantage, is, is the expectation citizens now have of their government because of those tools. The fact that you can go to Amazon and three clicks buy something, or you know, go to a travel site and do that, or you know, look up house values on Zillow, um, sets an expectation level for you that when you go to the Social Security website, and it forces you to download a form and fill it out and walk into an office and rip a sticker off a wall, wait an hour and a half to hand it back to someone who's going to type it in for you. Is, is just not something that most Americans will, will uh, embrace. And so, and so even, even people that are Social Security benefits age. And so we're, uh, we're seeing a, a tremendous dynamic and pressure on government to perform in a better way. That, the consumerization of technology, smart devices in everybody's pockets, and cybersecurity are all big pressures. Um, and it's forcing a massive wave of change. Um, um, actually, on that, tell me how you think about mobile in all of this, because I know at Zillow, we, we recently tipped where more homes are now viewed on mobile than on a desktop. Right. And a lot of businesses, consumer businesses, especially with location elements, are starting to see this. Um, and there are people who just do all their computing on a mobile device now. Right. So, so how do you think about mobile in, in the things that you're trying to do and how the government should think about mobile? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, this digital strategy that I put out a couple months ago at whitehouse.gov slash digitalgov. Um, if you're a geek, you can go to digitalgov slash html5 and see this cool regressive version of it. Uh, it it um, uh, 
it's central to, I think, everything we have to do in the future, especially in, in our case, the government, that many communities that aren't traditional consumers of broadband are now getting their internet you know, via mobile devices as well. And so we're seeing exponential growth in more disadvantaged communities and other things as well, and uh, people that tend to use more government services. And so we wanna make sure that we serve everyone and serve everyone well. Um, and so we have this huge obligation to, to reach those communities and to do that on every, every you know, anytime, anywhere, on any kind of device. And so we're, the strategy that we outline not only embraces sort of you know, machine readable and APIs and web services and stuff, but also, uh, you know, gets uh, agencies into streamlining their content via um, regressive or mobile type devices. And so you're gonna see, probably in the next six to 12 months, which are the deliverable time frame of this strategy, a wave of things coming out uh, from government. And there's some, there's some good examples out there now. Um, if you travel a lot, you know, the My TSA app from the from, uh, Transportation Safety Administration and Homeland Security is pretty good. It, it crowdsources wait times at airports, at security checkpoints, and so you can actually check the airport and check which, uh, which gate is faster and, and things like that and, and do all that. It's pretty, it's pretty cool, and there's other ones coming out. Uh, part of this is just we, we need to kind of get the word out about what we're doing, and, and uh, you'll see more of that, too. So one of the things I know you've worked on is this fellowship program that actually tries to get um, talent from private sector to come do a stint with the federal government. Tell yeah. us about that and how it works. Yeah, so we launched this the day I launched the digital strategy. The chief technology officer of the White House, uh, Todd Park, and I launched uh, Presidential Innovation Fellows, which was is a program where we allow private sector uh, uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, much like people here in the room, to take a turn in government, a paid position in the government for six months. Um, we, uh, Todd and I had assembled, um, and among others, had assembled this group of about 20 to 25 people across the federal government that we sort of deemed as innovators, people that either come from the private sector or were doing really interesting things within government, uh, and locked them in a room and basically said, okay, we're gonna, we need the top five game-changing ideas that, that we could do as a, as a singular community to, to uh, innovate within government, and, uh, and we're gonna, uh, we will, Todd and I will find ways of funding it, staffing it, doing other things to get these five done, and we're gonna do a new five every six months. We're just gonna go in and we're gonna incubate ideas every six months and start to create this virtuous cycle of innovation within government. Um, and with it, we found ways of doing, in a non-conflicted way, uh, allowing private sector people to take a paid rotation into the into the government, and so uh, and so we're uh, going to be doing a launch event. You're going to find out who these people are in a couple weeks uh, when we launch it. But they, uh, the day we launched it and put up the website whitehouse.gov/innovationfellows, we had um, within a couple of days had about 3,000 people applying to pick up their lives and move to D.C. No relocation package, no nothing, just and take a pay cut to come. And, and work for their government on these innovative projects. And the five projects really quickly are, are uh, one is open data initiatives. So it's getting private sector people to come in and, and work um, uh, helping agencies unlock their data in, in, in great ways with a particular emphasis on healthcare and energy are the two areas. Uh, one is a called Blue Button for America, which will allow every American to download electronic, a secure electronic version of their health records. This is something we provide today as a government to our veterans. We have over a million veterans who've actually downloaded uh, their medical records and can use them. So if you're getting prescription, you can just upload your medical record to one of the providers that support this format, which anyone that serves the government has to. Um, and uh, so we wanna make that available for everyone. Uh, one is um, RFPEZ, which is a request for, propo pro pro for proposal. And, and what that is, is, is we have uh, very efficient ways of, of getting sub $150,000 small entrepreneurial contractors to work with government. The problem is no agency knows how to utilize this program and nobody on the entrepreneurial side knows about this, this vast uh, you know, area of opportunity called the federal government that can, can get them. And so this project's gonna connect those two. Uh, number four is, is one uh, we call the 20% project, which is when we do foreign assistance uh, around the world, at the last mile of the transaction, we typically convert the, um, the foreign assistance to cash. So if you're digging a well in Guatemala or paving a road in, in, uh, in Afghanistan or something as part of our de delivering vaccines in, in, uh, in Africa, we typically convert that to cash. When we do, about 20 to 30% is skimmed off the top through corruption. So people, middlemen, take, 
take money off the top before it actually gets to the final person. And so effectively what this does is intends to convert that all to electronic, probably text-based um, transactions all the way to the endpoint. When we're running this in a few countries right now and it's really bearing amazing, it's basically, you know, we, we hope to, we call it the 20% campaign, which we think our foreign assistance budget is going to go up by 20% without us doing anything, which is, is, you know, just by thwarting this corruption, which is great. Uh, and then the last one is my project that I, that I pitched um, and we're staffing called MyGov, which is, you know, of the 40, 50,000 websites, what I tasked this team was, was give me a single citizen-centric experience of government um, in six months. I want a rapid prototype of that. And I purposely didn't say website, as you, you didn't hear me say website, because I want them, if they come back and say, you know, they won't, but if they come back and say a kick-ass call center is what you really need, then I'll create a kick-ass call center. But, I, you know, we're focusing on how can you take those forty to 50,000 experiences and, and make them one experience. It feels like a pretty massive project. <laughs> yeah, it is, but, uh, but I got to go, I got a, a dream team that's working on it right now, so. What, uh, what's frustrating about your job? Like, do you ever, you know, obviously there's probably times when you walk in and say, oh my God, there's 40,000 websites and I don't even know how to start on this. I mean, what are the frustrating areas since you came? Yeah, the, the, the big ones for me, and this is, this is a funny one when I came from Seattle and I moved to, to DC is I had made this assumption that everything I was seeing on television MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, whatever, whoever was publishing things about government was actually government. And there's, there's a big divide between politics and government. The press report on politics, they don't, they don't report on government. That's both a frustration point from the fact that I think most Americans don't really know what's going on in their government and all the important work that we're doing. I bet if I, I did a show of hands on how many of you heard something new today that you hadn't heard about before, everyone will raise their hand, hopefully except my wife. Uh, and and it, it uh, you know that that divide and the fact that we don't have a marketing budget, we don't have ways of kind of getting the word out about the not only good work but I think great work we're doing um, is part of it. So that's why I love doing events like this because we can get out and kind of talk about it and engage people in their networks and telling the story and, and magnifying that and amplifying that for us is is a big frustration point. Um, you know the the mechanics of working with government relative to to culture and Congress and kind of getting things done. There's definitely frustration points there that you have to work through. And for me, it's building new muscle. It's learning new things. And what's great about kind of technology is, is uh, it's this, you know, the pressures of consumerization and other things are, are waking people up to some degree. Uh, but it's also this hugely bipartisan thing where, you know, going in and talking about you know, job creation through the great work we're doing in technology, efficiency of government, 21st century ways of doing things, engaging citizens. You know, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you sit on, everyone loves that. And so we're, we have a, a, we can get some, some momentum there, but there's lots of moving parts you have to work through to get, to get Congress to act. And, and, and that's, a, that's a fun, both a frustration and kind of an exciting part of the job. So, so you talked about the difference between government and politics, but politics does still impact you? For example, I mean, you were an appointee from President Obama. What would happen if he's not reelected this fall? Well, that will have a big effect on me because... Yeah. <laughs> but is, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting thing to ponder, and I think it's hard for us in, in private sector to think about that. It's like, just when you get going on really good work, there could be a possibility that they flip it out for the next guy, and the next guy has to take you know, two years to ramp up to doing good work again if, if he does it all. And, you know, I mean, that's got to be frustrating just across the board in, in government in general that um, some really important positions are, are partisan and are connected with whomever's in the top office. A absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, your job is moving this gigantic ship, this ship of culture that's been heading a certain way for the last 20 years, and you're trying to get that to steer in a different direction. And, and every day you think about, you know, what are the quick wins I can go do? What are things I can do to get, get this stuff? Um, uh, and then how do, I, how do I, in my work, codify things for the long term? Either get laws established, which there is some, some desire for that in some cases. How do I put out policy that can stand the test of time and work beyond um, the, the, the people that are, are doing things? And then how do you get the, 
you can get the, the boulder over the top of the hill and start to roll them down the hill. You can create some forward momentum that will actually persist, I think, long term. So there are things I'm implementing that were out that were laid out in the in the Bush administration, for example, and we can carry that forward. So I'm learning from those and then understanding, okay, how do you then create good policy or get things enacted in law that codify things for the long term. But do that carefully because you could you could also codify a technology that that is outdated in the next few years and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to create a vendor preference or a direction that could go in certain ways. I, th I think we saw this in, in sort of the, the language that was inserted into law around just the use of paper. I mean, there are, there are these crazy laws that say if you hold a meeting, you have to like print so many copies and put it in the back of the room. There's and laws? There's that laws that, that, that say really? things like that depending wow. on situations. And so it's, it's under, undoing, undoing some of those things. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and getting people that are forward thinking enough to, to say, okay, a paper equivalent is if I put a terminal in the back of the room that people can sit down and look at something or do, you know, that that's, that's a moral equivalent in the same way. So it's getting people in Congress and others to think that way is, is part of the, the challenge. What's it like to actually report to the president? I mean, do you have weekly one-on-ones? Do you go through a review <laughs> process every six months? I mean, really, like, how, how, does, how does it work? How often do you get to see him? Uh, I see him, I see him every couple weeks. Um, a lot of bump ins in the hallway and things like that uh, are good. Uh, now, as the as the uh, as the campaign's ramping up, he's he's out and talking to people a lot more, uh, kind of on the road. And I've been fortunate enough to be involved in some of those uh, sessions where we go around and talk to different folks. And I'm doing one this weekend, and and uh, um, where I'll be with him. And so it's it's uh, that's that's where the face time really comes. It's it's really you know there's. You know, when you're when you're president, there are so many things. If you're doing something well, you get less face time, which is a good sign. Um, you know, they always somebody somebody gave me great advice and said, if uh, if the president never visits you, that's mean that means you're doing a great job. So if it, if he has to show up, then that means something's going off the rails, and he needs to he needs to get involved. And so it's a it's a good sign the less the less face time you have generally, and and uh, so means, compare means you're the, doing a great job. So. Compare the president to. Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer as a boss. I gave a I, I gave a talk at Harvard Law School a, a few months ago, and I I basically opened up the uh, the session saying I'm going to uh, I uh, I need to or Harvard Harvard Business School and Law School is like this joint thing, and and uh, I. Uh, I opened up the session talking about the virtues of me as an employee because almost everyone I worked for, the president, Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, Julius Janikowski are all Harvard grad, Harvard, either Harvard grads or, or nearly Harvard grads in the case of, uh, case of Bill Gates. And so it's, uh, it's an interesting notion from that standpoint. But it's, uh, um, you know, they're, they're, they're different people completely, um, different personalities, uh, but all share this sort of shared passion around results and, and excitement around the art of the possible. Um, and I think strike the careful balance between inspire and push. You know, kind of getting people excited about what can be possible and then figuring out how to, how to push people in the direction. Because um, there always will be people if you give, if you talk about the, the thing we can accomplish together, they'll just follow you to the hill and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go take on that next battle. Um, but there will always be those, the, the, the people that will kind of sit on their hands to some extent and you have to sort of push them along and figure out how do you, how do you carry them along too. And I think they, they all share that kind of the inspire and the passion around that inspire and then the, the desire and the necessity to, to push as well. And so that, that, that's probably the common trait across, across everybody. Personality-wise, they're all... They're all common and different, depending on the situation. I think you got a book deal in your future yeah. when you're done with Washington. <laughs> um, I know there are a lot of people who wanted to ask questions, and I do want to open it up to audience questions. In the next few months, every agency of government is going to have a, a government website slash developer page. So that's coming, where they're going to start publishing all their APIs in one place. Data.gov, which is the, the website that we sort of publish all our open data, is going to have a developer end of it. We actually have a GitHub account and everything associated with it that's all being stood up now that you're going to see. So data.gov will be the place. It'll be the central repository to not only find what data is available in government, but also um, what APIs are available if there's 
logic APIs beyond just data, data access to those. Um, the, the current website to learn all about these deliverables, what's coming when, where they'll be, all those things, is at uh, uh, wh.gov or whitehouse.gov slash digitalgov, one word. Um, and that, uh, that site um, uh, is up now and it's got a bunch of information. You can download the plan, look at all the stuff that's there and things. Uh, from a, from a uh, how are we gonna reach out to the communities that are affected, each agency largely has a constituent base that they oversee uh, in the industry. They work with private sector and others. You know, we're gonna go and, and do some work talking to publications and getting the president to talk about this stuff, which is a great uh, megaphone for us, as you can imagine. Uh, but each, uh, we're tasking each of the agencies to also reach out to their constituent bases. So in the case of the Federal Communications Commission, we did a lot of work to work with the Verizons and the AT&Ts and the others in the, in the world to make sure that they knew our licensing APIs were now available, our, our APIs were, you know, for doing different information transfers were now now available. All the all the agencies will be out there kind of doing this stuff. And I think this stuff will really come to light as apps start start being stood up and that use this stuff and and and, and we'll see that happen as well. So expect a big step change in the next six and twelve months. There's a bunch of thirty pages of deliverables that agencies are account held, being held accountable for and we're on track to hit those. So. On the first one on motivation, it's it's um, uh, it's it's a tough aspect, as you can imagine, of, of getting people to move. And it, it's a lot of times, uh, you know, there there are uh, you know ways of working with senior leadership and, and getting people sort of excited about what's what's possible within their uh, within their department or their agency to be done on on sort of kind of the inspire side. This is where the pressures that are applied. You know, around consumerization and, and cybersecurity and other things are creating a new dynamic where people are really following. The, phenomen the, the funny phenomenon, because that's sort of the very predictable one, and they're just our ways of inspiring people through their patriotism or, or, or technology or things. Um, Daniel Pink's book, Drive, is probably one of the best examples, I think, of, of methods I use to think about you know, uh, getting this stuff forward. The most amazing one that's not as predictable, though, in that case is we have you know, across government, amazing innovators, people that are literally like stuck down in basements with red staplers who have been held back their entire <laughs> life and told not to, not to go cause trouble, um, who just needed permission to go innovate. Um, the, the unlocked potential of government is, is that versus the, the naysayers. The naysayers will often always be naysayers, but if you can find a couple people that want to go change the game and you give them permission to do so, suddenly you unlock all this value. It's always the, I'm sure you see this here, right, where one great developer like outweighs 10, 10 bad developers on any software project or any, any solutions-based project. And, and it's that case there, too, where 10 naysayers compared to one person who's really just going to work those extra hours and get stuff done and, and drive a new dynamic because they suddenly get permission to. And I, you know, Todd, Todd Park, the CTO, and I go around and around federal agencies and public speeches and stuff. And the, the big thing we always tell government employees is we give you permission to innovate. Like, go do it. Break the rules. Figure out what to do. Lo, you know, take some risk and, and, and run, run with stuff. Um, and, uh, and the second on political opposition, Luckily, as I said earlier, a lot of this stuff we work on is pretty bipartisan, where, where we're able to kind of weave and dodge through, through any sort of political minefields because it's for a greater good. Now, there are things we work on, like the Affordable Care Act is very politically charged, health care in this country and, and other stuff where we're, we're, I'm helping sort of steer and, and helping the teams that are doing the technical implementation of that work. Um, and in many cases, um, the, the politic aspect has already happened by the time it gets handed off to the implementation side, and so it's, it's largely okay. The tough ones is, are where you get into, you know, all politics are local, and, and Congress in particular has, has, has interest in their own states or their districts, and if we're going in and like closing a data center because we've done vir the hard work to virtualize and optimize and consolidate it into one you know, more highly efficient data center. I shut one of those down in some district in the country, um, you know, that would effectively put some vendor out of work or some local employees have to do different work or things like that. It just creates a, creates a dynamic that we have to have conversations about. But, but largely, you know, 
I think people are well-meaning and understand the, 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 the ROI on that is so tremendous that, that it's important to do the work and, and to focus in that way. It's, it's thinking about the politics ahead of time, front-loading those into how you make decisions, how you position the work you're doing is the important part. Was that something, was that a shock to you or hard to get used to when you had to think about the politics first sometimes? A little bit. I mean, you, you, uh, you know, once you've worked for Bill or kind of grew up in Microsoft um, in the way it, it, it became so big that there were politics inside the company and so you thought about it in those kind of ways as well. Just, it's different, the, the, the guardrails are different, the operating between the guardrails is the same and so you have to sort of, once you understand it, then it's easy. And for me, it's just building new muscle. It's just, it's sort of a fun, I'm, I'm always wanting to learn the new thing and, and getting to, to, to know about uh, kind of the, the play that politics has in this stuff is, is really exciting, so. Yeah, some of that, much of that is not a federal transaction, it's a local transaction. Uh, but there's definitely a lot we can do in that case. Um, the, the thing I'm probably most excited about in that category is in December, um, I launched something called NSTIC, which is the National Standard for Trusted Identity in Cyberspace. It's the worst acronym ever. Uh, but it, it, what it basically implies, um, and I ordered government to basically say, if you do any citizen-facing systems from now on, um, and it requires a login, a secure login, you have to use this NSTIC standard. And what NSTIC basically prescribes are these multiple levels of authentication and trust around identity management. So the, the basic ones, like a basic username and password, can be relatively anonymous. Um, the second level is you have to show up and prove you are who you are at some, uh, uh, some, some facility, like say the post office, you show up with your passport and show you are and up levels you. The third is you have, have all the number one and number two is multi-factor authentication and then the number four is, this, is additional capabilities. And what the, the key here was not only did we describe this in these multiple levels in the, in the sort of model, but it was the trust between them. So I basically said if you, if you come into a federal agency at, at level two, uh, in agency A, agency B has to trust you're at level two and we can do an electronic transaction between the two of those. Now the magic happens not only at that level, so we're building a federated identity across the federal government to say all agencies need to trust across this NSTIC standard, but we're driving really hard to push that down into local. And so getting local, state and local governments to adopt this standard to say, okay, this is the way we're gonna do trusted identity will be the way we can transaction and locker information around citizens in a way that they can, they can choose what they, what they put out there and how that's, how that's used. We'll never get to you know, the, the five different agencies of government forms you know, where you have to sign each one differently and the bank and everyone else unless we can get some sort of trust scheme and that we think this is the first step of that is getting this NSTIC standard out there. Um, and, and driving this, this forward. Um, if you go to nist.gov, N-I-S-T, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, um, uh, that's, they're the keeper of NSTIC. They've actually worked with the private sector. We've got a bunch of private sector providers, RSA, OpenID, and a bunch of others who, who now support this NSTIC standard. Um, we're working really hard to get others. Um, and when we, have, when we implement uh, some new technology coming out in the next year in government that will be cross-government, uh, it's gonna use this, this technology. So we're gonna kind of flood the marketplace with user IDs that support this um, very soon. So I think we're in the first steps of, of getting down that road of, uh, and we, you, know, you can't realize electronic voting or anything unless you have a identity and trust model that you, that you can uh, stand behind. And so I think this is the first step of that. probably yet to be determined, I think, but um, it's, uh, I thought, you know, the, the crazy thing is when you, when I worked for Bill and I, um, I traveled the world with him and I actually helped during that period because he, he transitioned from CEO to chief software architect and was doing all the ramp up of the Gates Foundation from its focus on technology and libraries to world health. And I thought, I thought to myself that at least from a life adventure standpoint that I'd reached the pinnacle of, my, of that aspect uh, in that job. Little did I know that, that, uh, you know, that, that going and ha doing this job would, would far outpass um, that, that the life adventure aspect. And uh, you know, dinner in the White House or being on Air Force One, those are all kind of big bucket item lists that, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know. Lunchtime at Zillow. Yeah, that's it.
Yeah, so the, so the key things there is one, we just have this effort going. Um, part of the digital strategy uh, that I laid out was um, building common analytic tools across uh, the entire federal footprint. And so we, we're standing up um, a centralized analytic engine that I will, I will have every agency drop a little Java code on that will give me a dashboard across the entire 40 to 50,000 websites. What are the analytics there and, and what's being driven? And then we've set goals to, to at a minimum shut down like 50% of the, of the websites out there. Just, just get, get those off the books, even top level domains, um, or I guess in the technical parlance, second level domains beyond .gov. So, um, so we've got a lot of opportunity out there to just kind of shut those down. So we're doing those as kind of brute force mechanisms. And then the next level is using this digital strategy, uh, engaging citizens, engaging others on cleaning up the mess that, that exists inside the, the agencies to move those forward. We have about a 3,000 person web managers council um, that, that are kind of the most innovative web people across the federal government. And they've put together these strategies and plans to kind of roll, roll in a new, uh, a new dynamic inside. Um, I think that the key will be really getting agencies of government out of the web, web management business, and leave, but leave them in the content business. And so that's getting smarter about metadata and tagging and, and cross-pollination of information in a way that can change the dynamic. And I think the, the work that's happening kind of at, the, at that level at the agencies to think about that stuff and the MyGov effort, the, the team of innovators I have rapidly prototyping a single experience, those are gonna merge pretty quickly and we'll have, we'll have sort of one set of thinking about what we need to do as next steps. To Steve, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been great. Thank so you. So glad to have you. Thanks.